I'm fortunate that I have an expert panel with me today. They are all experienced experience in the urologists and have all dealt with various nightmares similar to the ones I'm going to present them with. And we are, should have an interesting session. Our panelists are Jim Lingerman from the University of Indiana, Marshall Stoller from University of California in San Francisco, Margaret Pearl from University of Texas in Dallas, Ojas Shah from Columbia University, and Stephen Nakada from University of Wisconsin. So the first case I'm going to present to you, Jim, is a 61-year-old female who has a, on ultrasound, has a right-sided staghorn stone in the renal pelvis. The medical history is she had two-fold history of right-sided stone passage. She's got acute right-sided polynephritis and recurrent right-sided flank pain. And her urologist, has, her family physician has sent you this ultrasound picture. And he's also sent you this intravenous urogram on this patient. Now, what I'd like to know, is this enough information for you to go ahead and do a percutaneous stone extraction or not? Generally, no. Um, in the current era, we always like to have a CT to look for anatomic considerations that might affect uh, how one goes about approaching the stone. Now, of course, all, all of us uh, uh, you know, practiced in an era when uh, uh, we relied just on the studies that you've shown, but I think uh, most uh, endourologists doing percutaneous procedures nowadays would, would like to have a CT beforehand. Exactly. And, and this patient had a big aneurysm in, in reality, and there wasn't a stone here, and we could have all fall into a trap if we didn't do routine CAT scans before every single case that we operate on. So the next thing, so you always need an adequate preoperative evaluation. And the next thing is we all want to operate on patients with sterile urine. So Marshall, here's a patient who had a pre-op urine culture that was ordered six or seven days prior to surgery. Two to three days later, the, the, the urine culture came back. It was an E. coli, a count of 100,000. And we started appropriate antibiotics three days post-operatively. Now, what do you do on the day of surgery? I, I would not do anything additionally. I would go ahead and give the antibiotics that were culture uh, sensitive uh, at the time of the procedure prior to making my incision. Does anybody feel any differently about this in the panel? So we all want to try and prevent gram-negative sepsis 15 to 30 percent of patients have post-op fever. One or two percent will have sepsis. We do the preoperative urine culture. We try to maintain a low-pressure system, with either with an amplet sheet or other some other continuous flow sheet, and we give preoperative antibiotics, as you mentioned. So, what I'd like to ask you, Peggy, if if you do a perk on a patient and now you put the needle in and as you dilate the 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 track and purulent material comes out. Would you go ahead and take out the stone sitting there or would you abort the procedure? Typically, I would not um, proceed with the procedure. Um, I would take some of that urine and send it or some of that purulent material and send it for culture and, and I would place a, a, a cope loop nephrostomy tube, a locking loop nephrostomy tube and Abort. The only time I would proceed is if I didn't think I could get adequate drainage of the collecting system. And then I might do a very limited procedure just to make room to put the tube in. But typically, um, I would just place a drainage tube and get out. So here's a patient that we did a, a percutaneous puncture on, and suddenly I hit a vessel and it's bleeding like crazy. What would you do in this situation? 
this is tricky in the sense that you've already hit something what looked like is arterial in that situation. Yeah, so, sure, it's arterial. It's pumping. I would actually probably remove my needle at that point and give myself a little bit of time. So, exactly. So you pull back the needle, and uh, you can see that that needle was right too deep and re just all we had to do was to reposition that needle and it was in the collecting system and we could carry on with the procedure. So the next uh, case, Steve, is I, I did a perk on this patient and I advanced the guide wire and as you can see the guide wire went straight across the renal vein up into the inferior vena cava and it's almost in the heart. Are you going to do anything special there? What are you going to do? Yeah, well, you've, uh, I would generally just remove it. You know, it's a venous structure and uh, carry on and reposition it, my, uh, my wire. Okay, so now this is a, a case that was referred to us by Ralph Clayman. And this is a 65 year old uh, woman with functionally solitary left kidney, bilateral nephrolithiasis, now recurrent UTI. The culture, urine culture was sterile. The CT scan shows the left kidney, the lower pole, infundibular stone, nine by seven by nine millimeters. The second lower pole, bilobed stone, 23 by 20 by 19 millimeters, with noted thinning of the overlying parenchyma. Hospital units, 1100. The right kidney is atrophic and has multiple stones. Renal scan, 94% on the left, 6% on the right. Here's the, some of the CT scan pictures. So Ralph did the following. A 14-inch urethral access sheet was placed. This is his technique. And then a supracostal 12th rib access obtained with a single stick into the superior posterior calyx under direct urethroscopic vision through and through guard wire was placed. A 24 balloon dilation and amplet sheet was placed. The two stones were identified in the lower pole with rigid and flexible ne nephroscopy and the removed. The larger stone was fragmented medially and then, and then they went to the more lateral calyx and that was serviced by a narrow infundibulum that would just admit the tip of the flexible ne nephroscope, revealing a stone containing blown out calyx. During the basketing of the stone fragments in the lower pole, blown out calyx, the patient suddenly developed severe hypertension, which responded poor, poorly to pressure. So they put in an infant nephrostomy tube and the case was terminated. And the question is, what would you have done differently in the, anything differently in the operating room at that point in time? Well, I think a couple things would happen. It could be a hydrothorax, although it's not usually this dramatic, but I would certainly fluoroscope the chest and see if there's fluid in the chest that I could drain on the table. The yes. sepsis, hemorrhage, pleural effusion, abdominal compartment syndrome as a differential. And in this case, this was a pleural effusion and they sent the patient to the ICU and then they realized the problem uh, uh, when they did the chest x-ray and then they put the chest tube in. <clears throat> and Peggy, what you did, what you suggested was co quite correct that obviously whenever this sort of thing happens, you've got a C-arm invariably in the operating room at the time. It's so easy to ask the anesthesiologist to ventilate the patient and you see if there's fluid in the chest or there isn't fluid in the chest and you go ahead and put in a chest tube if that's is what is required. If you do put in a chest tube, what size chest tube would you put in? So I typically put in a 10 French locking loop nephrostomy tube. So I, I access the chest the same way I access the kidney. Um, I just use a, a 22 gauge Chiba needle and I just find a rib and I just um, uh, puncture the pleural space and aspirate back fluid. And then I put a, a, a standard 018 inch uh, platinum tip guide wire into the chest and I follow that with a dilator and, um, and then put a 10 French locking loop nephrostomy tube. So same equipment 
and same technique as I use for, for percutaneous access to the kidney. And if it's, if, you know, unless it's blood, um, typically a 10 French coat loop will be adequate for, for irrigation fluid. And you'll know that- It's usually that pig fluid, isn't it? Pardon? It's usually bloodstained fluid. Yes. But it's not blood, thick blood. Correct. If it was thick blood, then you'd have to think about, uh, you know, a larger tube, but that's just rarely the case. So you can try and prevent pleural effusions with puncturing the patient in full ex exhalation and try where possible to do an infracostal puncture. So there's another case of Ralph, and this patient is a 61-year-old woman who complained of chronic right flank pain. Uh, the urine culture was proteus. The CT scan showed a right lower pole branch calculus. You can see it here. And a 16 French urethral axis sheath was placed and flexible urethroscope was passed to an upper pole uh, posterior calyx. Percutaneous access under urethroscopic control of the upper pole posterior calyx. The tract was dilated with a 10 millimeter balloon dilator and a 30 French amp that was advanced and into the renal pelvis. They proceeded with stone removal with given excellent drainage via the access sheath and the 30 French nephrostomy tube. Holium laser lithotripsy was initially uneventful, but approximately 45 into, minutes into the procedure, peak airway pressure rose to 40 millimeters of mercury with precipitous drop in blood pressure. So again, this is the problem that we're dealing with, Ojo. And the procedure was terminated. They put in a, a picked out a catheter and they thought that this was an abdominal compartment syndrome. So what would you do there? I mean, this is a bad situation with the perforation in the renal pelvis, but it looks like drainage would be the appropriate thing. And then this patient may actually need some, some sort of drainage of the abdominal cavity if they actually have an abdominal compartment syndrome with a lot of saline fluid in their abdomen. Uh, so what would you do? Uh, image, and then possibly you get, the, get a paracentesis or a drainage of the abdominal cavity. They terminated the procedure. They then gave Lasix and Manitol to mobilize the fluid, and the patient was turned supine. Abdominal pressures rose to 42 millimeters of mercury, tense abdomen and hypotensor. And what to do, what they did, they did an ultrasound in the operating room. They saw a large pocket of fluid in the left lower quadrant. And under ultrasound guidance, they put a nephrostomy needle into the collection, followed by a guide wire and the coat loop. And one liter of clear fluid came out and resolved the resolution of the hypertension and return of the abdominal uh, pressure to normal pressures. And then they subsequently removed the coat loop. So as a general principle, when you have a patient and this happens, you've dilated the tract and you've got a big hole like this in the renal pelvis, the best thing to do is to quit the case, put in a tube and come back another day. Another uh, case here, uh, this is a patient, a 34 year old patient with a staghorn calculus, uh, the right kidney with hydra and pyonephrosis. And during access to the pilocalyp seal system, there was an injury to the adenum and Steve, I don't know if you've seen one of these, how would you deal with it? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, effectively you, you abort the procedure. I would drain the kidney. And one of my residents did a perk on a patient and he couldn't get the guard wire to go down the ureter. So he took the back end of the guard wire and it went straight through the renal pelvis and into the duodenum. And at that stage, they called me and I said, we'll leave the patient with a nephrostomy and keep the patient on nasogastric suction and we'll see what, what happens. And in my training in general surgery, I did general surgery first for something like five years. 
and we went through the phase of treating perforated peptic ulcers conservatively and they did very well. So it wasn't all that surprising that this patient also did very well. So that is the, the initial way in which I would treat such a case. Now, here's a patient, um, Jim, who's an 82-year-old woman, uh, a man with a newly diagnosed metastatic cancer, was incidentally noted on CT to have uh, bilateral renal stones and Peggy's, this is Peggy's patient. And here's a CAT scan that you can see on this patient. And the management was you underwent bilateral simultaneous perks with the right axis by the lower pole calyx and above the 12th rib and on the left side directly onto the stone below the 12th rib. Unremarkable course on post-operative day number one, routine imaging with CT scan and an anti-grade nephrostogram was done. And this is the picture that you're seeing over here. So Jim, here's this post-op nephrostogram. And I don't know if there's another picture or not. This is... It's a little hard to tell from this, that one image. Well, here's another picture. The nephrostogram was found, the nephrostomy tube was found to be traversing the small bowel. On subsequent forms, they could determine that that was actually small bowel. So now you know you've got a nephrostomy tube going through the small bowel. What do you want to do with that case? So anyway, my point is that uh, it's a transperitoneal injury uh, uh, and it's, uh, if it is indeed small bowel, it needs to be repaired surgically by a general surgeon. Okay, so exactly that was the situation and they did, had an urgent exploration by the general surgeons. Conservative no. treatment with nephrostomy drainage and nasogastric suction is not an option with a small bowel injury. Now, one point uh, to make here, um, uh, Peggy does what I do, uh, uh, we do you know, an early scan on the patient, uh, and these patients, if you, if you find the injury early, they do much better. They, they, you, they get fixed right away, and uh, their intra-abdominal uh, issues are pretty minimal. Uh, if you uh, wait until they declare themselves clinically to image them, then often you're on uh, a stormy course. Yeah. Okay, so this was repaired and <clears throat> skin to skin, the general surgeons are sharp, 55 minutes. <laughs> this is a woman, 82 year old with a left partial staghorn calculus and I've just run through the pictures. And it, the case was unremarkable, rigid and flexible nephroscopy was performed to a single track with a high uh, confidence that all stones were removed. An anti-grade nephrostogram at the end of the case revealed normal spontaneous anti-grade flow without medial extravasation, and a 24 malicot re-entry tube was inserted. And here's the uh, the nephrostogram. This is the the subsequent pictures. Uh, that was the perk, sorry. And this is the nephrostogram at the end of the case. It's a horseshoe kidney. I'd like to make a couple other issues on the horseshoe kidney. I typically go into the upper pole uh, because that's going to be closer to the skin rather than a mid pole. And I think a lot of the issues that we've talked about here could potentially be avoided with using ultrasound as your guidance for your percutaneous access. You're able to see the bowel, you're able to see the pleura, you're able to see the spleen and the liver. And a lot of times we're able to just do the entire procedure under ultrasound guidance. So, But the essence of the, the case is what you have, you mentioned, and that is that a, stag, a, a horseshoe kidney, the approach to a horseshoe kidney is through the upper pole calyx. And in this case, they didn't do that. They used a lower, lower pole calyx. So what happened in this patient? Um, so at 24 hours post-operatively, they did a CAT scan on the patient and they found that the perk went through the descending colon. There was no sepsis, but it, 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 you could see the nephrostomy tube went straight through the colon. So here it is, here's the pictures confirming that. Okay, so now what is your approach in this situation? 
So if you've got a malincot going through uh, the colon and down the urinary system, it probably wasn't recognized right away. The horseshoe kidney, the anatomy is going to be a little different. Uh, I think you need to separate the two systems. I'd probably put a double J stent in from below. I would pull out the tube and I would make a little incision on the skin and put my finger in there to open up the area. And I usually put a, like a little uh, Penrose drain there to allow it uh, to drain. So you want to separate the GI from the GU system here. Uh, alternatively, you could call general surgery in to see if they wanted to repair the colon. But I think in the meantime, I would probably put a double J stand in with a Foley catheter, make the incision a little bigger, open up the tract with my finger or like a little schnitt and then put a Penrose drain in. So if there is something that needs to be drained, it would drain out through the skin. So what we've been doing is, is a, we'd also have a double pigtail stent in the collecting system, but here you can see the collect, communication with the bowel. And what I would tend to do is to go ahead and then try and put a catheter into the colon as a colotomy, uh, a, a tube that goes into the colon and then pull the colon onto into the retroperitoneum and in that way, have the situation under control. And then you see, here's a situation where the acid is now in the colon. And you could put a balloon catheter in there and hold it in position. And here it is. And then a double pigtail uh, catheter in the, in the collecting system. And this way we leave the the tube in the colon for about a, a week and by that time everything settles and we feel that you have complete control of the system okay this is a, a 45 year old uh, patient uh, who underwent percutaneous nephrostomy and postoperatively the pain was well controlled and there was a foley and a nephrostomy tube in place the next morning she was found to be short of breath and the CAT scan was done, and she's, this patient's now got a pneumothorax, you can see on the left side, and the tube went directly through her spleen. So we now have a situation where there's a pneumothorax as well as a, a, a tube in the going through the spleen. So they put a pigtail catheter into the chest, and the pneumothorax resolved, and now the question is, how do you deal with a splenic injury? And um, Peggy, do you want to comment on that? Um, I mean, I, th I think there's a couple ways to deal with it. I mean, I've had one, I think. Um, and I actually had uh, general surgery get involved in that. I mean, it's the spleen is less forgiving than the liver. Um, so I, I worry more about splenic injuries. And what the rate, what the, uh, I had general surgery and interventional radiology involved. And what they actually did was um, they took the patient's interventional radiology to remove the nephrostomy tube after we had placed an internal stent. And they backed out the tube, but they put um, gel foam, they injected gel foam through the nephrostomy tube and then coiled the tract and put gel foam on the other side. So they basically had a, a um, sort of a gel foam coil sandwich around the spleen. This was a patient who actually had to go back on anticoagulation um, and you know, it, it didn't bleed. Now that's an N of one, um, but, it, but it was clever and they were able to inject something through the tract and sort of watch it um, as they did it and, and to at least try to um, lessen the likelihood of having a bleed postoperatively. The so, other alternative is leave it in for longer, but I don't, I don't know what the, 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 the magic length of time for that is. And this patient had to be anticoagulated. I, I, I wanted to do it under controlled circumstances sort of then and there. So this patient was hemodynamically stable and actually we've had two patients now with uh, injuries to the spleen and we treated them conservatively and we left the tube in for about a week and then removed the nephrostomy tube and the patient did quite well. All right, at, at this point, I'd like to thank my panel for their help and guidance and we will close the session at this point in time. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you, Arthur. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye.